ladies and gentlemen, to the Extra Point Show. My apologies for the technical difficulties uh, a few moments ago. We are going to pick up right where we left off with the free agent frenzy. Uh, for those that are just now joining us, um, some quick hits. Um, Aaron Jones running back for the Green Bay Packers. He decides to re-sign with Green Bay on a four-year, $48 million deal with $13 million of those dollars guaranteed. Again, he's a key cog in um, the Packers' quest to return to the NFC Championship game and even host an NFC Championship game. Um, very productive running back, on over 30 touchdowns in the last two years, um, and has had a prolific start to the first four years of his career, unlike we've seen in uh, since uh, Jim Brown, actually, and, and literally. Um, it's been a, a bad day for the Tennessee Titans as far as free agency goes so far. No new signings, but three notable names that are off their wish list for 2021. Uh, one would be Corey Davis, who um, alluded on Instagram earlier today that he will not be re-signed by the Tennessee Titans and he will become an, um, a free agent, which he is right now. So him and his agent are currently negotiating with other teams to uh, find his next landing spot. He was a huge part of Tennessee's offense last year, had almost 1,000 yards receiving, averaged 15 yards per, per reception, and uh, was one. It was a top 10 receiver as far as um, quarterback uh, QBR when being targeted. It was a quarterback rating of 122 when targeting Corey Davis last year. Um, but... To give me pause on the Corey Davis deal, I'm, I, I kind of have to give pause on on any player that has their best season during their contract year. He's an incredible blocker downfield, which is important for an offense that features a running back like Derrick Henry, who can take it the distance from anywhere on the field. I get that. Uh, he was a comparable number two to A.J. Uh, Brown. But to, to lose uh, Corey Davis just tells me now that the Titans are counting on Brown to continue his ascent. He went from rookie of the year quality type season, his rookie season, to last year Pro Bowl, to maybe next year being an all pro. And taking away some targets that went to Corey Davis should help him in that quest. Um, it's just going to be interesting to see what the Titans do to replace him at number two because their third string receiver, Adam Humphreys, has already been let go and is entering free agency as well. Um, John o. Smith, if you missed uh, the first part of the extra point segment, he is now a New England Patriot. He will uh, be signing there for on a four-year, um, $50 million deal with $31.25 million guaranteed, uh, the highest amount of guarantees ever paid to a tight end, even more than Travis Kelsey, even more than George Kittle. You know, Kelsey has to be keeping his eye on that um, when his deal uh, comes to be restructured in a few years. I believe he just restructured his deal to free up some cap space for Kansas City this year, but we'll see how that impacts him on his next bite of the apple. And one of the big names that was thrown around in Nashville as far as for the Titans um, and their need for a pass rusher was Shaq Barrett, who was rumored to be hitting the, the free agent market, but that name is now crossed off the list. He is just officially signed um, with Tampa Bay to return to his Super Bowl champion team. Four years, $72 million, $36 million guaranteed. That's kind of too rich for Tennessee's blood because they're in cap purgatory right now. <sighs> Better days ahead for my Tennessee Titans. We will update you throughout the week on any moves they make and any of your favorite teams make as well. Um, also big on everybody's mind right now is the um, much-anticipated return of March Madness. Yes, the college bracket has finally been revealed. Selection Sunday was less than 24 hours ago. And we're going to, to do a deeper dive into this as we go through the week. But I want to start off um, the uh, my breakdown of March Madness and the college um, tournament with the one seeds, the number one seeds, and, um, and to break them down and to, to give you my opinion on who could be their biggest threat to making it to the Final Four. Now, we're going to start with Gonzaga. And first, before we start with Gonzaga, let's, um, let's start with the year 1976. 1976 could, it's going to be an important year potentially for this year's tournament because, um, for one, this is the first tournament since, what, 1976, where Duke and Kentucky 
are both out of the tournament. Shouts out to Brandon Lewis checking back in. We will be talking Oklahoma um, later on this week, so make sure you stick around for that. Shouts out to my boy Gary Young in the building, <laughs> nephew, and his two princes. Shouts out to you. Shouts out and congratulations to you on the extension of your family. Your son looks absolutely adorable. You my boy for life. Hope you are doing fantastic. Um, so 1976, that's the last time um, that Duke and Kentucky was not in the tournament. 1976 is also the last time a team went undefeated through the regular season and through the tournament. That was Indiana. Now, that brings us to Gonzaga, who are the only undefeated team uh, in the tournament at 26-0. and 26-0. and And right now, they are everyone's odds-on favorite to win the tournament. Now, one thing that I found kind of fishy about this, Brandon. Now, you let me know if you don't think this is fishy or not. Yes, Gonzaga is the number one overall seed. They were the number one team in the country wire to wire throughout the entire season. They hadn't dropped a game. And usually the number one overall seed does get the easiest bracket as a, as a, a thank you to them uh, of sorts. But I find it very strange that Gonzaga in their bracket, they're facing three teams in their bracket that they've already beat that happen to be the second, the third, and the fourth seed in their region. That is, I mean... Okay, I get trying to reward a team for, you know, for doing well in the regular season. But my goodness, if that's not a competitive advantage, the second, third, and fourth seed in your in your conference, in your bracket, you've already beaten this year? Like, <laughs> what is that about? They beat Iowa, the number two seed. They beat Kansas, the number three seed. And they beat Virginia, the number four seed. Um, does somebody at CBS want, <laughs> want the Zags? In the big dance or what? Like, <laughs> like what? What is that about? You want to talk about some home cooking? The what? What's next? You gonna play them all in Spokane instead of Indy? I don't know. I don't get it. Um, that gives them a very, very um, advantage, a good advantage, I would say, over the rest of the field. Um, now, Brandon says, "Shoot, yeah, that's weird. I have never seen that happen before. If somebody has receipts." to where that has happened before, then let me know. But it seems like you could have moved that third seed or fourth seed to another conference or another bracket to kind of keep things even. I digress. Um, one of the things about Gonzaga that makes them so dangerous is the fact that they have a great mix of youth and experience. Um, they have ten, five players are basically averaging double digits, and their, their youngest player, freshman Jalen Suggs, is going to be a top five pick in this year's draft. So when your youngest player is your best player, and we all know the guard play pretty much rules the day in college basketball, and especially in these tournaments. If you have a dominant guard that can get hot, you too can run off six in a row and be cutting down the nets on that uh, first Monday in April. Um, but this team is loaded. They have veteran experience. They're coached well. Uh, again, they, they're young in all the right places and have veteran leadership around their best player who, again, will be a top five pick in this year's draft. Uh, shouts out to Jalen Suggs uh, for that. Um, now, if I had to pick their biggest their biggest competition, really in the Zags um, a case, their biggest competition could come in the second round. And this is where you come in, uh, Mr. Brandon. That Oklahoma-Missouri game could be very telling as to what happens with Gonzaga going forward. I believe that either one of those teams – um, given what we've seen from Gonzaga historically in the tournament, is, either one of those teams can bounce them before the Sweet 16. I think that that would be one of their toughest matchups. And uh, if Virginia were able to continue to progress through, I think that they would be the next biggest matchup. Um, yes, Iowa does have the, the National Player of the Year and uh, Luke Garza, but Garza, seeing him play so many times in the Big Ten, if he doesn't get you 25 and 10, that team is pretty much done. A lot of people on that roster, they like to sit around and watch him play. And if he doesn't have it going, they just kind of mail it in. Now, is that fair or unfair? I'm not sure. But what, I, but it does tell me that, that Gonzaga can be had. If they get past Oklahoma or Missouri, whoever comes out of that, that um, round of 32 bracket, then they pretty much should be a lot to get into the Final Four, pretty much. I'll give you my final four predictions on Friday after everybody has filled out their brackets. Now, next up is Baylor. 22-2 and two on the season. They were undefeated before their COVID break. 
um, hiatus or whatnot, and then struggled a little bit after that. Now, Brandon says, let me get his comment up there. I'll get that up there in just, just a second. But with Baylor, they were they were dominant and undefeated before late in the season, late in February, when they got bit by the COVID bug and um, and had to miss some time. They came back a little bit rusty. But here's what I have to say about Baylor that, that's scary for any opponent that's going to be facing them in that bracket. Baylor, <laughs> from the three-point line, y'all, I am not making this up. You can fact, fact check this. The lowest three-point percentage that they have on their roster is, is a, a, a player that's shooting 38.6%. 38.6% will get you a starting job in the NBA <laughs> if you shoot 38% from behind the arc. 38% is the lowest percentage of all of the players on Baylor's team uh, from the three-point line. You got a 42%, a 39%, a 46%, 42%, 41%, 50%, 62.5% from the three-point line. What in the world? What in the world? Um, so this is a team that even if um, that even if you know they have a rough defensive game, it's hard to imagine them being so cold from the three point line that everybody on that roster misses. So they're just going to outscore you. Now Brandon says we beat Bama. Bama struggled against Missouri. So if OU plays like they did during that winning streak, we should make it happen against Mizzou. I agree. And I saw that game with OU against Bama. It was a Saturday afternoon game, and I happened to catch that game. And if and if they can slow down a high-powered offense like Bama, then yes, I give them uh, more than a puncher's chance to knock off the Zags, especially if Jalen Suggs has um, a lackluster uh, performance at any time. Good point by you, Brandon. Okay, so let's move to the third number one seed. That's the Illinois Fighting Illini. But before we do that, my bad. On Baylor, there's a couple of teams out there that can give them problems, most notably the Ohio State Buckeyes. Ohio State is big. They're physical. Uh, uh, Liddell and uh, Washington are two prolific scorers. They play physical. They will beat you up. They, they can muddy up the waters. If, if you're a Baylor team, they will pound you in the middle, and they are very scrappy defensively around that three-point line. So if there's, a, if there's one team that you don't want to have a bad shooting night against, that's um, that's uh, Ohio State if they get that far. Now, they could get tripped up in the round of 32 because we have an eight-seed North Carolina facing a nine-seed Wisconsin. Um, both Blue Blood uh, traditional programs that had down seasons, but you know when they get in the tournament, their coaching and, and their, their pedigree could be just enough to give Baylor everything they want if Baylor is sleepwalking in that second round. But if there's one team that I would actually – bet money on that could beat Baylor, it would be Ohio State and the way that they play inside and out. They're very scrappy, very uh, very defensive-oriented team. Um, I like that. Um, oh, you was there live for that OU Bama? Nice. Nice. Yeah, oh, you got down on Alabama that, that game. I couldn't believe it. Um, so, shouts out to OU for that. Now, our third number one seed, that's going to be the University of Illinois. They finished 23-6. and six. They ran through the Big Ten Conference Tournament after losing out percentage points uh, behind Michigan for the regular season tournament. Y'all, Illinois looked like the, the most complete and dominant team in, in college basketball right now. Um, Michigan Mike said on Friday's show that, that the best team going into March Madness, going into the tournament, was Illinois, and they did nothing to disappoint later on um, Saturday and Sunday in the um, – in the conference tournament, they are loaded. First of all, they got dogs on their team. They're scrappy. They're confident. They can go inside. They can go outside. Um, their guard, A.U. Uh, Dismanu, um, please forgive me if I mispronounced that, but Mr. A.O., uh, he's had triple doubles this season, something that you rarely see in college. Uh, he will attack the rim. He can shoot the three. They are big and physical. They got physical bigs. And, um, and all that. Now, Brandon says, we need to watch out for, for them, Illinois. Brad Underwood cooking up something with them fighting Illini. They sure are. Because they put some Wolverines in a pot and threw some fat meat in it and cooked us like a pot of greens in, in Chrysler Center a couple of weeks ago. Beat our butts down. And without Isaiah Livers, we'll get to Michigan in just a second. Um, I really don't see anybody uh, getting past Illinois. I love the bracket that they're in if I'm a fighting Illini fan. Now, when you look at the second seed in their region, 
Um, that's Houston. Houston is made in the image of Illinois. They have a, a bunch of, uh, of um, physical, tough players. They're interchangeable in the low post, and, and they're well coached. But I don't think they have the firepower offensively to deal with the Illinois if Illinois is on their game. Um, now, one of the teams that I think that could really upset them even before they get to um, the Final Four is Oklahoma State. Because Cade Cunningham, he's a monster too. And he's definitely going in the top five of this year's draft, if not number one overall. So I hope we get to see Oklahoma State and um, and Illinois uh, fight it out in the tournament. I would hope I would like to see that matchup. I really would. You're talking about um, two lottery picks that's going to be going head to head um, in AO and in Cade Cunningham. Sign me up for that. But I don't see them having much pushback from getting to the Final Four. And as much as I hate to say it as a Michigan fan, man, I don't see anybody knocking them off into the championship game. But, again, I will give my Final Four predictions on Friday after we turned in our sheets just to protect everyone that, that may be going into a bracket. I don't want to give out any nuggets beforehand or give you some advice that messes up your bracket. <laughs> and you got money on the line. You ain't going to hit me back up and say, uh, oh, no, man, you told me to take this team. Like, nah, I'm going to tell you after you make your selections. Now, Brandon says, Kay Cunningham saw him live against OU. He kicked it up in the second half. Woo-wee. Now, Brandon, uh, look, do, do you need a best friend? Because you went, you you saw some some incredible games in the tournament this year. You going to Indy? <laughs> you saw Kate Cunningham play. You saw Alabama play. Like, those are two heavyweights this year. So, good job by you. A sports fan through and through. Good job by you. Now, the last number four, uh, one seed is Michigan. The Michigan, of all the number one seeds out there, they're catching the most flack because of how they ended the season. Ended the season losing three of their last five games. And then to compound that, uh, their starting uh, senior forward, Isaiah Livers, is out indefinitely with a, a stress fracture in his foot. Now, while some people in Mason Blue want to think that he may come back later on in the tournament if they were to make it to the Elite Eight or the Final Four, I say, hell no. Don't even think about it. If I'm Isaiah Livers' parents, brother, confidant, best friend, whatever, I'm like, look, bruh, the, the NBA draft is a couple of months away, and you need to get healthy and get ready for that because you do have NBA pedigree. You you have a chance to get drafted by the NBA this year, and you don't want to ruin that by trying to come back early and messing your foot up even worse to where you possibly won't be ready for the combine and the draft and things of that nature. So, Isaiah, as a Michigan fan, I took my hat to you. You've meant a lot to the program. You've had a Final Four run. You've played in the national championship game. Um, if the team can rally around you this year, you'll still get your ring. Um, again, last night, a lot of the national pundits were, were picking all the ones but Michigan to make it uh, to the Final Four. And and I understand their calls for Pauls with, again, with Michigan uh, struggling down the stretch and losing Isaiah Livers. But let's not forget that, Mi that Michigan is one of the um, deepest and best defensive teams in the entire uh, country. They're number one in defensive efficiency rating, so – and opponents' field goal percentage. So if Michigan just takes their defense and packs their, their lunch pail, uh, that'll be enough to get them at least to the Sweet 16. Also, let's not forget that a couple of graduate transfers that came over this year could pay huge dividends in the loss of an Isaiah Rivers. Um, that's uh, Chauncey Brown and Michael Smith. Both were uh, graduate transfers, and both were offensively-minded players while at Wake Forest and... Um, while at, uh, he was at an Ivy League school, can't remember which one, but he was a 20 point per game scorer prior to taking over the point guard uh, play, and that's Mike Smith for Michigan. So he'll be asked to carry a little bit more of the load offensively, which he can. Michigan's, um, Livers was not the leading scorer on the team. You got Hunter Dickinson and, um, and Franz Wagner that are, are more of the offensive load carriers. Now, uh, Eli Brooks is back healthy. They have a deep and talented bench, and again, if they bring their defense, they should be okay. But there are a couple of teams out there that I'm worried about, most notably the 4 c Florida State Seminoles, if they were to match up against Michigan, and here's why. Michigan has struggled when the opposing big has had his way with freshman and soon-to-be freshman of the year, Hunter Dickinson. Hunter Dickinson, when, when he can, he's a, a physical block of an old-school type player. He doesn't have much of a mid-range game, has zero outside game, 
but he can work either elbow in the block. His post-up game is good, and he's a great slasher to the rim on the pick and roll. Um, but when the opposing bigs can neutralize him, Michigan has struggled offensively. And uh, Florida State has versatile bigs that they can throw at him in waves. Um, they also were, were uh, one of the, the favorites to make it to the Final Four last year, but there was no tournament. They bring a lot of those guys back, and I'm sure they have a chip on their shoulder um, after getting upset in the ACC championship game. Um, Brandon says, man, I got lucky this year with the schedule. I wish I could. <laughs> right, me too. Although um, we may be going home the same weekend if Michigan don't get it together and LSU or St. Bonaventure come to play, we could both be going out in the round of 32, but that's okay. Um, so um, that's it for free agency right now. We're going to keep you up to date as the week goes on. You can catch me here every weekday, Monday through Friday, uh, right here at Facebook Live. I will be updating you on um, the latest news with free agency, what's going on with your favorite team, what's going on with the Tennessee Titans. And we'll do a deeper dive as we get closer to tip-off for the playing games for this year's NCAA tournament. It's your boy, Mr. P.L. Coulter. I enjoyed my time with you today. Look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Go have you a great day. And the next time you pass the mirror, tell yourself, I love you. You all of that and a bag of chips. Hey, don't wait for nobody else to tell you. Tell yourself, I'll see you tomorrow. Peace.